Narrative of A. Gordon Pym by Edgar Allan Poe Chapter 2 In no affairs of mere prejudice, pro or con, do we deduce inferences with entire certainty, even from the most simple data. It might be supposed that a catastrophe such as I have just related would have effectually cooled my incipient passion for the sea. On the contrary, I never experienced a more ardent longing for the wild adventures incident to the life of a navigator than within a week after our miraculous deliverance. This short period proved amply long enough to erase from my memory the shadows and bring out in vivid light all the pleasurably exciting points of color, all the picturesqueness of the late perilous accident. My conversations with Augustus grew daily more frequent and more intensely full of interest. He had a manner of relating his stories of the ocean, more than one half of which I now suspect to have been sheer fabrications, well adapted to have weight with one of my enthusiastic temperament and somewhat gloomy, although glowing, imagination. It is strange, too, that he most strongly enlisted my feelings in behalf of the life of a seaman when he depicted his more terrible moments of suffering and despair. For the bright side of the painting I had a limited sympathy. My visions were of shipwreck and famine, of death or captivity among barbarian hordes, of a lifetime dragged out in sorrow and tears upon some grey and desolate rock in an ocean unapproachable and unknown. Such visions or desires, for they amounted to desires, are common, I have since been assured, to the whole numerous race of the melancholy among men. At the time of which I speak I regarded them only as prophetic glimpses of a destiny which I felt myself in a measure bound to fulfill. Augustus thoroughly entered into my state of mind— it is probable, indeed, that our intimate communion had resulted in a partial interchange of character. About eighteen months after the period of the Ariel's disaster, the firm of Lloyd and Redenburg, a house connected in some manner with the Messrs. Enderby, I believe, of Liverpool, were engaged in repairing and fitting out the brig Grampus for a whaling voyage. She was an old hulk and scarcely seaworthy when all was done to her that could be done. I knew hardly why she good vessels belonging to the same owners, but so it was. Mr. Bernard was appointed to command her, and Augustus was going with him. While the brig was getting ready, he frequently urged upon me the excellency of the opportunity now offered for indulging my desire of travel. He found me by no means an unwilling listener, yet the matter could not be so easily arranged. My father made no direct opposition, but my mother went into hysterics at the bare mention of the design, and, more than all, my grandfather, from whom I expected much, vowed to cut me off with a shilling, if I should ever broach the subject to him again. These difficulties, however, so far from abating my desire, only added fuel to the flame. I determined to go at all hazards, and having made known my intentions to Augustus, we set about arranging a plan by which it might be accomplished. In the meantime, I forbore speaking to any of my relations in regard to the voyage, and— as I busied myself ostensibly with my usual studies, it was supposed that I had abandoned the design. I have since frequently examined my conduct on this occasion with sentiments of displeasure as well as of surprise. The intense hypocrisy I made use of for the furtherance of my project, a hypocrisy pervading every word and action of my life for so long a period of time, could only have been rendered tolerable to myself by the wild and burning expectation with which I looked forward to the fulfillment of my long-cherished visions of travel. In pursuance of my scheme of deception, I was necessarily obliged to leave much to the management of Augustus, who was employed for the greater part of every day on board the Grampus, attending to some arrangements for his father in the cabin and cabin hold. At night, however, we were sure to have a conference and talk over our hopes. After nearly a month passed in this manner, without our hitting upon any plan we thought likely to succeed, he told me at last that he had determined upon everything necessary— I had a relation living in New Bedford, uh, Mr. Ross, at whose house I was in the habit of spending occasionally two or three weeks at a time. The brig was to sail about the middle of June, 1827, and it was agreed that, a day or two before her putting to sea, my father was to receive a note, as usual, from Mr. Ross, asking me to come over and spend a fortnight with Robert and Emmett, his sons. Augustus charged himself with the indicting of this note and getting it delivered. Having set out as supposed for New Bedford, I was then to report myself to my companion, who would contrive a hiding place for me in the Grampus. This hiding place, he assured me, would be rendered sufficiently comfortable for a residence of many days, during which I was not to make my appearance. 
when the brig had proceeded so far on her course as to make any turning back a matter out of question, I should then, he said, be formally installed in all the comforts of the cabin, and, as to his father, he would only laugh heartily at the joke. Vessels enough would be met with by which a letter might be sent home explaining the adventure to my parents. The middle of June at length arrived, and everything had been matured. The note was written and delivered, and on a Monday morning I left the house for the new Bedford packet, as supposed. I went, however, straight to Augustus, who was waiting for me at the corner of a street. It had been our original plan that I should keep out of the way until dark, and then slip on board the brig, but as there was now a thick fog in our favour, it was agreed to lose no time in secreting me. Augustus led the way to the wharf, and I followed at a little distance, enveloped in a thick seaman's cloak, which he had brought with him so that my person might not easily be recognised. Just as we turned the second corner, after passing Mr. Edmund's well, who should appear standing right in front of me and looking me full in the face, but old Mr. Peterson, my grandfather. "'Why, bless my soul, Gordon,' said he, after a long pause. "'Why, why, whose dirty cloak is that you have on?' "'Sir,' I replied, assuming as well as I could, in the exigency of the moment, an air of offended surprise, and talking in the gruffest of all imaginable tones, "'Sir, you are somewhat mistaken. My name in the first place be it nothing at all like Garden, and I'd want you for to know better, you blackguard, than to call my new overcoat a darty one. For my life, I could hardly refrain from screaming with laughter at the odd manner in which the old gentleman received this handsome rebuke. He started back two or three steps, turned first pale and then excessively red, threw up his spectacles, then putting them down, ran full tilt at me with his umbrella uplifted. He stopped short, however, in his career, as if struck with a sudden recollection, and presently, turning round, hobbled off down the street, shaking all the while with rage and muttering between his teeth, "'Won't do. New glasses. Thought it was Gordon. Damn good-for-nothing salt water long, Tom.' After this narrow escape— we proceeded with greater caution, and arrived at our point of destination in safety. There were only one or two of the hands on board, and these were busy forward doing something to the forecastle combings. Captain Bernard, we knew very well, was engaged at Lloyd and Redenburg's, and would remain there until late in the evening, so we had little to apprehend on his account. Augustus went first up the vessel's side, and in a short while I followed him, without being noticed by the men at work. We proceeded at once into the cabin, and found no person there. It was fitted up in the most comfortable style, a thing somewhat unusual in a whaling vessel. There were four very excellent staterooms with wide and convenient berths. There was also a large stove, I took notice, and a remarkably thick and valuable carpet covering the floor of both the cabin and staterooms. The ceiling was full seven feet high, and in short everything appeared of a more roomy and agreeable nature than I had anticipated." Augustus, however, would allow me but little time for observation, insisting upon the necessity of my concealing myself as soon as possible. He led the way into his own stateroom, which was on the starboard side of the brig, and next to the bulkheads. Upon entering, he closed the door and bolted it. I thought I had never seen a nicer little room than the one in which I now found myself. It was about ten feet long, and had only one berth, which, as I said before, was wide and convenient." In that portion of the closet, nearest the bulkheads, there was a space of four feet square, containing a table, a chair, and a set of hanging shelves full of books, chiefly of travel and voyages. There were many other little comforts in the room, among which I ought not to forget a kind of safe or refrigerator, in which Augustus pointed out to me a host of delicacies, both in the eating and drinking department. He now pressed with his knuckles upon a certain spot of the carpet in one corner of the space just mentioned, letting me know that a portion of the flooring, about sixteen inches square, had been neatly cut out and again adjusted. As he pressed, this portion rose up at one end sufficiently to allow the passage of his finger beneath. In this manner he raised the mouth of the trap, to which the carpet was still fastened by tacks, and I found that it led into the afterhold. He next lit a small taper by means of a phosphorus match, and, placing the light in a dark lantern, descended with it through the opening, bidding me follow. I did so, and he then pulled the cover upon the hole by means of a nail driven into the underside, the carpet, of course, resuming its original position on the floor of the stateroom, and all traces of the aperture being concealed. The taper gave out so feeble a ray that it was with the greatest difficulty I could grope my way through the confused mass of lumber among which I now found myself. By degrees, however, my eyes became accustomed to the gloom, and I proceeded with less trouble, holding on to the skirts of my friend's coat. 
he brought me at length, after creeping and winding through innumerable narrow passages, to an iron-bound box, such as is used sometimes for packing fine earthenware. It was nearly four feet high, and full six long, but very narrow. Two large empty oil casks lay on the top of it, and above these again a vast quantity of straw matting piled up as high as the floor of the cabin. In every other direction around was wedged as closely as possible, even up to the ceiling, a complete chaos of almost every species of ship furniture, together with a heterogeneous medley of crates, hampers, barrels, and bales, so that it seemed a matter no less than miraculous that we had discovered any passage at all to the box. I afterward found that Augustus had purposely arranged the stowage in this hold, with a view to affording me a thorough concealment, having had only one assistant in the labor, a man not going out in the brig. My companion now showed me that one of the ends of the box could be removed at pleasure. He slipped it aside and displayed the interior at which I was excessively amused. A mattress from one of the cabin berths covered the whole of its bottom, and it contained almost every article of mere comfort which could be crowded into so small a space, allowing me, at the same time, sufficient room for my accommodation either in a sitting position or lying at full length. Among other things, there were some books, pen, ink, and paper, three blankets, a large jug full of water, a keg of sea biscuit, three or four immense bologna sandwiches, an enormous ham, a cold leg of roast mutton, and half a dozen bottles of cordials and liquors. I proceeded immediately to take possession of my little apartment, and this with feelings of higher satisfaction, I am sure, than any monarch ever experienced upon entering a new palace. Augustus now pointed out to me the method of fastening the open end of the box, and then, holding the taper close to the deck, showed me a piece of dark whipcord lying along it. This, he said, extended from my hiding place throughout, and the necessary windings among the lumber, to a nail which was driven into the deck of the hold immediately beneath the trap door leading into a stateroom. By means of this cord I should be enabled readily to trace my way out without his guidance, provided any unlooked-for accident should render such a step necessary. He now took his departure, leaving with me the lantern, together with a copious supply of tapers and phosphorus, and promising to pay me a visit as often as he could contrive to do so without observation. This was on the 17th of June. I remained three days and nights, as nearly as I could guess, in my hiding-place, without getting out of it at all, except twice for the purpose of stretching my limbs by standing erect between two crates just opposite the opening. During the whole period I saw nothing of Augustus, but this occasioned me little uneasiness, as I knew the brig was expected to put to sea every hour, and in the bustle he would not easily find opportunities of coming down to me. At length I heard the trap open and shut, and presently he called in a low voice, asking if all was well, and if there was anything I wanted. "'Nothing,' I replied. "'I am as comfortable as can be. When will the brig sail?' "'She will be under way in less than half an hour,' he answered. I came to let you know, and for fear you should be uneasy at my absence. I shall not have a chance of coming down again for some time, perhaps for three or four days more. All is going on right above board. After I go up and close the trap, do you creep along by the whipcord to where the nail is driven in? You will find my watch there. It may be useful to you, as you have no daylight to keep time by. I suppose you can't tell how long you have been buried. Only three days. This is the twentieth. I would bring the watch to your box, but am afraid of being missed." With this he went up. In about an hour after he had gone, I distinctly felt the brig in motion, and congratulated myself upon having at length fairly commenced a voyage. Satisfied with this idea, I determined to make my mind as easy as possible, and await the course of events until I should be permitted to exchange the box for the more roomy, although hardly more comfortable, accommodations of the cabin. My first care was to get the watch— Leaving the taper burning, I groped along in the dark, following the cord through windings innumerable, in some of which I discovered that, after toiling a long distance, I was brought back within a foot or two of a former position. At length I reached the nail, and, securing the object of my journey, returned with it in safety. I now looked over the books which had been so thoughtfully provided, and selected the expedition of Lewis and Clark to the mouth of the Columbia. With this I amused myself for some time, when, growing sleepy, I extinguished the light with great care, and soon fell into a sound slumber. Upon awakening, I felt strangely confused in mind, and some time elapsed before I could bring to recollection all the various circumstances of my situation. By degrees, however, I remembered all. Striking a light, I looked at the watch, 
but it was run down, and there were, consequently, no means of determining how long I slept. My limbs were greatly cramped, and I was forced to relieve them by standing between the crates. Presently, feeling an almost ravenous appetite, I bethought myself of the cold mutton, some of which I had eaten just before going to sleep, and found excellent. What was my astonishment in discovering it to be in a state of absolute putrefaction? This circumstance occasioned me great disquietude, for, connecting it with the disorder of mind I experienced upon awakening, I began to suppose that I must have slept for an inordinately long period of time. The close atmosphere of the hold might have had something to do with this, and might in the end be productive of the most serious results. My head ached excessively. I fancied that I drew every breath with difficulty, and, in short, I was oppressed with a multitude of gloomy feelings. Still, I could not venture to make any disturbance by opening the trap or otherwise, and, having wound up the watch, contented myself as well as possible. Throughout the whole of the next tedious twenty-four hours, no person came to my relief, and I could not help accusing Augustus of the grossest inattention. What alarmed me chiefly was— that the water in my jug was reduced to about half a pint, and I was suffering much from thirst, having eaten freely of the bologna sausages after the loss of my mutton. I became very uneasy, and could no longer take any interest in my books. I was overpowered, too, with a desire to sleep, yet trembled at the thought of indulging it, lest there might exist some pernicious influence like that of burning charcoal in the confined air of the hold. In the meantime— the roll of the brig told me that we were far in the main ocean, and a dull humming sound, which reached my ears as if from an immense distance, convinced me no ordinary gale was blowing. I could not imagine a reason for the absence of Augustus. We were surely far enough advanced on our voyage to allow of my going up. Some accident might have happened to him, but I could think of none which would account for his suffering me to remain so long a prisoner, except, indeed, his having suddenly died or fallen overboard— and upon this idea I could not dwell with any degree of patience. It was possible that we had been baffled by headwinds and were still in the near vicinity of Nantucket. This notion, however, I was forced to abandon, for such being the case, the brig must have frequently gone about, and I was entirely satisfied from her continual inclination to the larboard that she had been sailing all along with a steady breeze on her starboard quarter. Besides, granting that we were still in the neighborhood of the island— why should not Augustus have visited me and informed me of the circumstance? Pondering in this manner upon the difficulties of my solitary and cheerless condition, I resolved to wait yet another twenty-four hours when, if no relief were obtained, I would make my way to the trap and endeavour either to hold a party with my friend or get at least a little fresh air through the opening and a further supply of water from the stateroom. While occupied with this thought, however, I fell in spite of every exertion to the contrary into a state of profound sleep or rather stupor. My dreams were of the most terrific description. Every species of calamity and horror befell me. Among other miseries, I was smothered to death between huge pillows, by demons of the most ghastly and ferocious aspect. Immense serpents held me in their embrace, and looked earnestly in my face with their fearfully shining eyes. Then deserts, limitless, and of the most forlorn and awe-inspiring character, spread themselves out before me, Immensely tall trunks of trees, grey and leafless, rose up in endless succession as far as the eye could reach. Their roots were concealed in wide-spreading morasses, whose dreary water lay intensely black, still, and altogether terrible beneath. And the strange trees seemed endowed with a human vitality, and waving to and fro their skeleton arms, were crying to the silent waters for mercy in the shrill and piercing accents of the most acute agony and despair. The scene changed, and I stood naked, and alone amidst the burning sand-plains of Sahara. At my feet lay crouched a fierce lion of the tropics. Suddenly his wild eyes opened and fell upon me. With a convulsive bound he sprang to his feet and laid bare his horrible teeth. In another instant there burst from his red throat a roar like the thunder of the firmament, and I fell impetuously to the earth. Stifling in a paroxysm of terror, I at last found myself partially awake. My dream, then, was not all a dream. Now at least— I was in possession of my senses. The paws of some huge and real monster were pressing heavily upon my bosom. His hot breath was in my ear, and his white and ghastly fangs were gleaming upon me through the gloom. Had a thousand lives hung upon the movement of a limb or the utterance of a syllable, I could have neither stirred nor spoken. The beast, whatever it was, retained his position without attempting any immediate violence, 
while I lay in utterly helpless and, I fancied, a dying condition beneath him. I felt that my powers of body and mind were fast leaving me, in a word, that I was perishing, and perishing of sheer fright. My brain swam. I grew deadly sick. My vision failed. Even the glaring eyeballs above me grew dim. Making a last strong effort, I at length breathed a faint ejaculation to God and resigned myself to die. The sound of my voice seemed to arouse all the latent fury of the animal. He precipitated himself at full length upon my body. But what was my astonishment when, with a long and low whine, he commenced licking my face and hands with the greatest eagerness and with the most extravagant demonstration of affection and joy. I was bewildered utterly lost in amazement, but I could not forget the peculiar whine of my Newfoundland dog, Tiger, and the odd manner of his caresses I well knew. It was he. I experienced a sudden rush of blood to my temples, a giddy and overpowering sense of deliverance and reanimation. I rose hurriedly from the mattress upon which I had been lying, and throwing myself upon the neck of my faithful follower and friend, relieved the long oppression of my bosom in a flood of most passionate tears." As upon a former occasion, my conceptions were in a state of the greatest indistinctness and confusion after leaving the mattress. For a long time I found it nearly impossible to connect any ideas, but, by very slow degrees, my thinking faculties returned, and I again called to memory the several incidents of my condition. For the presence of Tiger I tried in vain to account, and after busying myself with a thousand different conjectures respecting him, was forced to content myself with rejoicing that he was with me to share my dreary solitude and render me comfort by his caresses. Most people love their dogs, but for Tiger I had an affection far more ardent than common, and never certainly did any creature more truly deserve it. For seven years he had been my inseparable companion, and in a multitude of instances had given evidence of all the noble qualities for which we value the animal. I had rescued him, when a puppy, from the clutches of a malignant little villain in Nantucket who was leading him with a rope round his neck to the water, and the grown dog repaid the obligation about three years afterwards by saving me from the bludgeon of a street robber. Getting now hold of the watch, I found upon applying it to my ear that it had again run down. But at this I was not at all surprised, being convinced from the peculiar state of my feelings, that I had slept as before for a very long period of time. How long, it was, of course, impossible to say. I was burning up with fever, and my thirst was almost intolerable. I felt about the box for my little remaining supply of water, for I had no light, the taper having burnt to the socket of the lantern, and the phosphorus box not coming readily to hand. Upon finding the jug, however, I discovered it to be empty, Tiger, no doubt, having been tempted to drink it, as well as to devour the remnant of mutton, the bone of which lay well picked by the opening of the box. The spoiled meat I could well spare, but my heart sank as I thought of the water. I was feeble in the extreme, so much so that I shook all over as with an egg at the slightest movement or exertion. To add to my troubles, the brig was pitching and rolling with great violence, and the oil casks which lay upon my box were in momentary danger of falling down, so as to block up the only way of ingress or egress. I felt also terrible suffering from seasickness. These considerations determined me to make my way at all hazards to the trap, and obtain immediate relief before I should be incapacitated from doing so altogether. Having come to this resolve, I again felt about for the phosphorus box and tapers, the former I found after some little trouble, but not discovering the tapers as soon as I had expected, for I remembered very nearly the spot in which I had placed them, I gave up the search for the present, and, bidding Tiger lie quiet, began at once my journey toward the trap. In this attempt my great feebleness became more than ever apparent. It was with the utmost difficulty I could crawl along at all, and very frequently my limbs sank suddenly from beneath me, when, falling prostrate on my face, I would remain for some minutes in a state bordering on insensibility. Still I struggled forward by slow degrees, dreading every moment that I should swoon amid the narrow and intricate windings of the lumber in which event I had nothing but death to expect as the result. At length, upon making a push forward with all the energy I could command, I struck my forehead violently against the sharp corner of an iron-bound crate. The accident only stunned me for a few moments, but I found, to my inexpressible grief, that the quick and violent roll of the vessel had thrown the crate entirely across my path so as effectually to block up the passage. With my utmost exertions I could not move it a single inch from its position. 
it being closely wedged in among the surrounding boxes and ship furniture. It became necessary, therefore, enfeebled as I was, either to leave the guidance of the whipcord and seek out a new passage, or to climb over the obstacle and resume the path on the other side. The former alternative presented too many difficulties and dangers to be thought of without a shudder. In my present weak state of both mind and body, I should infallibly lose my way if I attempted it, and perish miserably amid the dismal and disgusting labyrinths of the hold. I proceeded, therefore, without hesitation, to summon up all my remaining strength and fortitude, and endeavour, as I best might, to clamber over the crate. Upon standing erect, with this end in view, I found the undertaking even a more serious task than my fears had led me to imagine— on each side of the narrow passageway arose a complete wall of various heavy lumber, which the least blunder on my part might be the means of bringing down upon my head, or if this accident did not occur, the path might be effectually blocked up against my return by the descending mass, as it was in front by the obstacle there. The crate itself was a long and unwieldy box upon which no foothold could be obtained. In vain I attempted by every means in my power to reach the top, with the hope of being thus enabled to draw myself up. Had I succeeded in reaching it, it is certain that my strength would have proved utterly inadequate to the task of getting over, and it was better in every respect that I failed. At length, in a desperate effort to force the crate from its ground, I felt a strong vibration in the side next to me. I thrust my hand eagerly to the edge of the planks, and found that a very large one was loose. With my pocket-knife, which luckily I had with me, I succeeded, after great labour, in prying it entirely off, and getting it through the aperture discovered— to my exceeding joy, that there were no boards on the opposite side, in other words, that the top was wanting, it being the bottom through which I had forced my way. I now met with no important difficulty, and proceeding along the line, until I finally reached the nail. With a beating heart I stood erect, and with a gentle touch pressed against the cover of the trap. It did not rise as soon as I had expected, and I pressed it with somewhat more determination, still dreading lest some other person than Augustus might be in his stateroom. The door, however, to my astonishment, remained steady, and I became somewhat uneasy, for I knew that it had formerly required little or no effort to remove it. I pushed it strongly. It was nevertheless firm. With all my strength, it still did not give way. With rage, with fury, with despair, it set at defiance my utmost efforts, and it was evident, from the unyielding nature of the resistance, that the whole had either been discovered and effectually nailed up, or that some immense weight had been placed upon it, which it was useless to think of removing. My sensations were those of extreme horror and dismay. In vain I attempted to reason on the probable cause of my being thus entombed. I could summon up no connected chain of reflection, and sinking on the floor gave way unresistingly to the most gloomy imaginings in which the dreadful deaths of thirst, famine, suffocation, and premature interment crowded upon me as— the prominent disasters to be encountered. At length there returned to me some portion of presence of mind. I arose, and felt with my fingers for the seams or cracks of the aperture. Having found them, I examined them closely to ascertain if they emitted any light from the stateroom, but none was visible. I then forced the blade of my penknife through them until I met with some hard obstacle. Scraping against it, I discovered it to be a solid mass of iron which, from its peculiar wavy feel as I passed the blade along it, I concluded to be a chain-table. The only course now left me was to retrace my way to the box, and there either yield to my sad fate, or try so to tranquilize my mind as to admit of my arranging some plan of escape. I immediately set about the attempt, and succeeded after innumerable difficulties in getting back. As I sank utterly exhausted upon the mattress, Tiger threw himself at full length by my side, and seemed as if desirous by his caresses of consoling me in my troubles, and urging me to bear them with fortitude. The singularity of his behaviour at length forcibly arrested my attention. After licking my face and hands for some minutes, he would suddenly cease doing so, and utter a low whine. Upon reaching out my hand toward him, I then invariably found him lying on his back, with his paws uplifted. This conduct, so frequently repeated, appeared strange, and I could in no manner account for it. As the dog seemed distressed, I concluded that it received some injury, and taking his paw in my hands, I examined them one by one, but found no sign of any hurt. I then supposed him hungry, and gave him a large piece of ham, which he devoured with avidity, afterward, however, resuming his extraordinary manoeuvres. 
I now imagined that he was suffering, like myself, the torments of thirst, and was about adopting this conclusion as the true one, when the idea occurred to me that I had as yet only examined his paws, and that there might possibly be a wound upon some portion of his body or head. The latter I felt carefully over, but found nothing. On passing my hand, however, along his back, I perceived a slight erection of the hair extending completely across it. Probing this with my finger, I discovered a string, and tracing it up, found that it encircled the whole body. Upon a closer scrutiny, I came across a small slip of what had the feeling of letter paper, through which the string had been fastened in such a manner as to bring it immediately beneath the left shoulder of the animal. The end of chapter two of Narrative of A. Gordon Pym by Edgar Allan Poe.